Chapter 46 of Jerusalem to Revelations A Quartet of Spiritual Experience by William Blake and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. The Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Courtney Langdon. Inferno One. Introduction to The Divine Comedy The Wood and the Mountain. When, halfway through the journey of our life, I found that I was in a gloomy wood, because the path which led aright was lost, and ah, how hard it is to say just what this wild and roughened stubborn woodland was, the very thought of which renews my fear. So bitter tis that death is little worse, but of the good to treat which there I found, I'll speak of what I else discovered there. I cannot well say how I entered it. So full of slumber was I at the moment when I forsook the pathway of the truth. But after I had reached a mountain's foot, where that veil ended which had pierced my heart with fear, I looked on high and saw its shoulders mantled already with that planet's rays which leadeth one aright o'er every path. Then quieted a little was the fear which in the lake depths of my heart had lasted throughout the night I passed so piteously. And even as he who from the deep emerged with sorely troubled breath upon the shore turns round and gazes at the dangerous water, even so my mind, which still was fleeing on, turned back to look again upon the pass which ne'er permitted any one to live. When I had somewhat eased my weary body, o'er the lone slope I so resumed my way, that ere the lower was my steady foot, then Lo, not far from where the ascent began, a leopard which, exceeding light and swift, was covered over with a spotted hide, and from my presence did not move away. Nay, rather, she so hindered my advance that more than once I turned me to go back. Some time had now from early morn elapsed, and with those very stars the sun was rising, that in his escort were, when love divine, in the beginning moved those beauteous things. I therefore had, as cause for hoping well, of that wild beast with gaily mottled skin, the hour of daytime, and the year's sweet season. But not so, that I should not fear the sight which next appeared before me of a lion. Against me, this one seemed to be advancing with head erect, and with such raging hunger that even the air seemed terrified thereby. And of a she-wolf, which with every lust seemed in her leanness laden, and had caused many ere now to lead unhappy lives. The latter so oppressed me with the fear that issued from her aspect that I lost the hope I had of winning to the top. And such as he is who is glad to game, and who, when times arrive that make him lose, weeps, and is saddened in his every thought, such did that peaceless animal make me, which gainst me coming pushed me step by step back to the place where silent is the sun while toward the lowland i was falling fast the sight of one was offered to mine eyes who seemed through long continued silence weak when him in that vast wilderness i saw have pity on me i cried out to him whate'er thou be o oh shade o oh very man not man he answered 
I was once a man, and both my parents were of Lombardy, and mansions with respect to fatherland. Neath Julius was I born, though somewhat late, and under good Augustus' rule I lived in Rome, in days of false and lying gods. I was a poet, and of that just man, Anchises' son, I sang, who came from Troy, after proud Ilion had been consumed. But thou, to such sore trouble, why return? Why climbst thou not the mountain of delight, which is of every joy the source and cause? Art thou that Virgil, then, that fountainhead, which poureth forth so broad a stream of speech? I answered him, with shame upon my brow. O oh, light and glory of the other poets, let the long study and the ardent love which made me con thy book avail me now. Thou art my teacher and authority. Thou only art the one from whom I took the lovely manner which hath done me honour. Behold the beast on whose account I turned. From her protect me, O thou famous sage, for she makes both my veins and pulses tremble. A different course from this must thou pursue, he answered, when he saw me shedding tears, if from this wilderness thou wouldst escape, for this wild beast on whose account thou criest, alloweth none to pass along her way, but hinders him so greatly that she kills and is by nature so malign and guilty, that never doth she sate her greedy lust, but after food is hungrier than before. Many are the animals with which she mates, and still more will there be, until the hound shall come and bring her to a painful death. He shall not feed on either land or wealth, but wisdom, love, and power shall be his food, and tween two feltros shall his birth take place. Of that low Italy he'll be the saviour, for which the maid Camilla died of wounds with Turnus, Nisus, and Aureolus, and he shall drive her out of every town till he have put her back again in hell, from which the earliest envy sent her forth. I therefore think, and judge it best for thee, to follow me, and I shall be thy guide, and lead thee hence through an eternal place, where thou shalt hear the shrieks of hopelessness of those tormented spirits of old times, each one of whom bewails the second death. Then those shalt thou behold, who, though in fire, contented are, because they hope to come, when e'er it be unto the blessed folk, to whom thereafter, if thou wouldst ascend, there'll be for that a worthier soul than I. With her at my departure I shall leave thee, because the emperor who rules up there, since I was not obedient to his law, wills none shall come into his town through me. He rules as emperor everywhere, and there as king, there is his town and lofty throne. O oh, happy he whom he thereto elects. And I to him, O oh, poet, I beseech thee, even by the God it was not thine to know, so may I from this ill and worse escape. Conduct me thither where thou saidst just now, that I may see St. Peter's gate, and those whom thou describest as so whelmed with woe. He then moved on, and I behind him kept. Inferno 2 Introduction to The Inferno The Mission of Virgil Daylight was going, and the dusky air was now releasing from their weary toil 
all living things on earth, and I alone was making ready to sustain the war both of the road and of the sympathy which my unerring memory will relate. O oh, muses, O oh, high genius, help me now, O oh, memory that wrotest what I saw, herewith shall thy nobility appear. I then began, Consider, poet, thou that guidest me, if strong my virtue be, or ere thou trust me to the arduous course, thou sayest that the sire of Silvio entered, when still corruptible the immortal world, and that while in his body he was there, hence that to him the opponent of all ill was courteous, considering the great result that was to come from him, both who and what, seems not unfitting to a thoughtful man, for he of fostering Rome and of her sway in the Empyrean heaven was chosen as sire, and both of these, if one would tell the truth, were foreordained unto the holy place where greatest Peter's follower hath his seat. While on this quest, for which thou givest him praise, he heard the things which of his victory the causes were, and of the papal robe, the chosen vessel went there afterward, to bring thence confirmation in the faith, through which one enters on salvation's path. But why should I go there, or who concedes it? I'm not Aeneas, nor yet Paul am I. Me worthy of this, nor I nor others deem. If, therefore, I consent to come, I fear lest foolish be my coming. Thou art wise, and canst much better judge than I can talk. And such as he who unwills what he willed, and changes so his purpose through new thoughts, that what he had begun he wholly leaves. Such on that gloomy slope did I become, for as I thought it over, I gave up the enterprise so hastily commenced. If I have rightly understood thy words, replied the shade of that great-hearted man. Thy soul is hurt by shameful cowardice, which many times so sorely hinders one, that from an honoured enterprise it turns him, as seeing falsely doth a shying beast. In order that thou rid thee of this fear, I'll tell thee why I came, and what I heard the first time I was grieved on thy account. Among the intermediate souls I was, when me a lady called, so beautiful and happy that I begged her to command. Her eyes were shining brighter than a star, when sweet and softly she began to say, as with an angel's voice she spoke to me, O oh, courteous Mantuan spirit, thou whose fame is still enduring in the world above, and will endure as long as lasts the world, a friend of mine but not a friend of fortune, is on his journey o'er the lonely slope, obstructed so that he hath turned through fear, and from what I have heard of him in heaven, I fear, lest he may now have strayed so far, that I have risen too late to give him help. Bestir thee then, and with thy finished speech, and with whatever his escape may need, assist him so that I may be consoled. I, who now have thee go, am Beatrice. Thence come I, whither I would fain return. T'was love that moved me, love that makes me speak when in the presence of my lord again, often shall I commend thee unto him. Thereat she ceased to speak, and I began. O oh, lady of virtue, thou through whom alone the human race excels all things contained within the heaven that hath the smallest circles, 
Thy bidding pleases me so much That late I'd be, hadst thou already been obeyed, Thou needst but to disclose to me thy will. But tell me why thou dost not mind descending Into this centre from that ample place, Whither thou art so eager to return. Since thou wouldst know thereof so inwardly, I'll tell thee briefly, she replied to me, Why I am not afraid to enter here. Of those things only should one be afraid, That have the power of doing injury, Not of the rest, for they should not be feared. I, of his mercy, and so made by God, That me your wretchedness doth not affect, nor any flame of yonder fire molest. There is a gentle lady up in heaven, Who grieves so at this check, Whereto I send thee, That broken is stern judgment there above. She called Lucia in her prayer, and said, Now hath thy faithful servant need of thee, And I too recommend him to thy care. Lucia, Hostile to all cruelty, set forth their act, and came unto the place where I with ancient Rachel had my seat. Why, Beatrice, she said, true praise of God, dost thou not succour him who loved thee so that for thy sake he left the common herd? Dost thou not hear the anguish of his cry? Seest not the death that fights him on the flood, O'er which the sea availeth not to boast? Ne'er were there any in the world so swift To seek their profit and avoid their loss, As I, after such words as these were uttered, Descended hither from my blessed seat, Confiding in that noble speech of thine, Which honours thee, and whosoe'er has heard it. Then, after she had spoken to me thus, Weeping, she turned her shining eyes away, Which made me hasten all the more to come, And even as she wished, I came to thee, And led thee from the presence of the beast, Which robbed thee of the fair mount's short approach. What is it then? Why, why dost thou hold back? Why dost thou lodge such baseness in thy heart? And wherefore free and daring art thou not, Since three so blessed ladies care for thee Within the court of heaven, and my words too Give thee the promise of so much that's good. As little flowers by the chill of night, Bowed down and closed, when brightened by the sun, Stand all erect and open on their stems, So likewise with my wearied strength did I, And such good daring caused into my heart, That I began as one who had been freed. O oh, piteous she, who hastened to my help, And courteous thou, that didst at once obey The words of truth that she addressed to thee, Thou hast with such desire disposed my heart Toward going on, by reason of thy words, that to my first intention I've returned. Go on now, since we two have but one will, Thou, leader, and thou, lord, and teacher thou. I thus addressed him, then, when he had moved, I entered on the wild and arduous course. Inferno 3 The Gate and Vestibule of Hell Cowards and Neutrals Acheron Through me one goes into the town of woe, Through me one goes into eternal pain, Through me among the people that are lost. Justice inspired my high exalted maker, I was created by the might divine, the highest wisdom, and the primal love. Before me there was naught created, save eternal things, and I eternal last. All 
hope abandon ye that enter here these words of gloomy colour i beheld inscribed upon the summit of a gate whence i their meaning teacher troubles me and he to me like one aware replied all fearfulness must here be left behind all forms of cowardice must here be dead we've reached the place where as i said to thee thou see the sad folk who have lost the good which is the object of the intellect then after he had placed his hand in mine with cheerful face whence i was comforted he led me in among the hidden things there sighs and wails and piercing cries of woe reverberated through the starless air hence i at first shed tears of sympathy strange languages and frightful forms of speech words caused by pain accents of anger voices both loud and faint and smiting hands withal a mighty tumult made which sweeps around for ever in that timelessly dark air as sand is wont whene'er a whirlwind blows and i whose head was girt about with horror said teacher what is this i hear what folk is this that seems so overwhelmed with woe and he to me this wretched kind of life the miserable spirits lead of those who live with neither infamy nor praise commingled are they with that worthless choir of angels who did not rebel nor yet were true to god but sided with themselves the heavens in order not to be less fair expelled them nor doth neither hell receive them the heavens in order not to be less fair expelled them nor doth nether hell receive them because the bad would get some glory thence and i what is it teacher grieves them so it causes them so loudly to lament i'll tell thee very briefly he replied these have no hope of death and so low down is this unseeing life of theirs that envious they are of every other destiny the world allows no fame of them to live mercy and justice hold them in contempt the world allows no fame of them to live mercy and justice hold them in contempt let us not talk of them but look and pass and i who gazed intently saw a flag which whirling moved so swiftly that to me contemptuous it appeared of all repose and after it there came so long a line of people that i never would have thought that death so great a number had undone when some i'd recognised i saw and knew the shade of him who through his cowardice the great refusal made i understood immediately and was assured that this the band of cowards was who both to god displeasing are and to his enemies these wretched souls who never were alive were naked and were sorely spurred to action by means of wasps and hornets that were there the latter streaked their faces with their blood which after it had mingled with their tears was at their feet sucked up by loathsome worm when i had given myself to peering further people i saw upon a great stream's bank i therefore said now teacher grant to me that i may know who these are and what law makes them appear so eager to cross over as in this dim light i perceive they are and he to me their things 
will be made clear to thee as soon as on the dismal strand of Acheron we shall have stayed our steps. Thereat, with shame suffused and downcast eyes, and fearing lest my talking might annoy him, up to the river I abstained from speech. Behold then, coming toward us in a boat, an aged man, all white with ancient hair, who shouted, Woe to you, ye <laughs> souls depraved, give up all hope of ever seeing heaven. I come to take you to the other shore, into eternal darkness, heat and cold. And thou, that yonder art a living soul, withdraw thee from these fellows that are dead. But when he saw that I did not withdraw, he said, By other roads and other ferries shalt thou attain a shore to pass across, not here. A lighter boat must carry thee. To him, my leader, Sharon, be not vexed. Thus is it yonder world, where there is power to do what e'er is willed, so ask no more. Thereat were quieted the woolly cheeks of that old boatman of the murky swamp, who round about his eyes had wheels of flame. Those spirits, though, who nude and weary were, their colour changed and gnashed their teeth together as soon as they had heard the cruel word. They kept blaspheming God and their own parent, the human species and the place and time and seed of their conception and their birth. Then each and all of them drew on together, weeping aloud to that accursed shore which waits for every man that fears not God. Sharon, the demon, with his ember eyes, makes beckoning signs to them, collects them all, and with his awe beats whoso takes his ease. Even as in autumn leaves detach themselves, now one and now another, till their branch sees all its stripped off clothing on the ground, so one by one the evil seed of Adam cast themselves down that river bank at signals, as doth a bird to its recalling lure. Thus o'er the dusky waves they wend their way, and ere they land upon the other side, another crowd collects again on there. My son, the courteous teacher said to me, all those that perish in the wrath of God, from every country come together here, and eager are to pass across the stream, because justice divine so spurs them on, that what was fear is turned into desire. A good soul never goes across from hence. If Sharon, therefore, findeth fault with thee, well canst thou now know what his words imply. The darkling plain, when this was ended, quaked, so greatly that the memory of my terror bathes me even now with sweat. The tear-stained ground gave forth a wind whence flashed vermilion light, which in me overcame all consciousness, and down I fell like one whom sleep o'ertake. Inferno 4 The First Circle The Borderland Unbaptized worthies, illustrious pagans. A heavy thunderclap broke the deep sleep within my head, so that I roused myself, as would a person who is waked by force. And standing up erect, my arrested eyes, I moved around, and with a steady gaze I looked about to know where I might be. Truth is, I found myself upon the verge of pain's abysmal valley, which collects the thunder-roll of everlasting woes. So dark it was, so deep and full of mist, that howsoe'er I gazed into its depths, nothing at all did I discern therein. Into this blind world 
let us now descend the poet who was death-like pale began i will be first and thou shalt second be and i who of his colour was aware said how am i to come if thou take fright what won't to be my comfort when afraid the anguish of the people here below, he said to me, brings out upon my face the sympathy which thou dost take for fear. Since our long journey drives us, let us go. Thus he set forth, and thus he had me enter the first of circles girding the abyss. Therein, as far as one could judge by listening, there was no lamentation saving sighs which caused a trembling in the eternal air and this came from the grief devoid of torture felt by the throngs which many were and great of infants and of women and of men to me then my good teacher dost not ask what spirits these are whom thou seest here now I would have thee know, ere thou go further, that these sinned not, and though they merits have, it is not enough, for they did not have baptism, the gateway of the creed believed by thee. And if before Christianity they lived, they did not with due worship honour God. And one of such as these am I myself. For such defects and for no other guilt were lost and only hurt to this extent that in desire we live deprived of hope great sorrow filled my heart on hearing this because i knew of people of great worth who in that borderland suspended were tell me my teacher tell me thou my lord i then began the wishing to be sure about the faith which conquers every error. Came any ever by his own deserts, or by another's hence, who then was blessed? And he, who understood my covert speech, replied, To this condition I was come, but newly, when I saw a mighty one come here, crowned with the sign of victory. From hence he drew the earliest parent shade, and that of his son Abel, that of Noah, and Moses the lawgiver and obedient, Abraham the patriarch, and David king, Israel, with both his father and his sons, and Rachel too, for whom he did so much, and many others, and he made them blessed. And I would have thee know that, earlier than these, there were no human spirits saved. Because he talked, we ceased not moving on, but all the while were passing through the wood, the wood, I mean, of thickly crowded shades. Nor far this side of where I fell asleep had we yet gone, when I beheld a fire which overcame a hemisphere of gloom. Somewhat away from it we were as yet, but not so far but I could dimly see that honourable people held that place. O oh, thou that honourest both art and science, who are these people that such honour have, that it divides them from the other's life? And he to me, the honourable fame which speaks of them in thy live world above, in heaven wins grace, which thus advances them. And hereupon a voice was heard by me. Do honour to the loftiest of poets, his shade which had departed now returns. And when the voice had ceased and was at rest, four mighty shades I saw approaching us, their looks were neither sorrowful nor glad. My kindly teacher then began to say, Look at the one who comes with sword in hand before the three, as if their lord he were. Homer he is, the sovereign poet, Horace the satirist, 
the one that cometh next, the third is Ovid, Lucan is the last. Since each of them in common shares with me the title which the voice of one proclaimed, they do me honour, and therein do well. Thus gathered I beheld the fair assembly of those the masters of the loftiest song which soareth like an eagle or the rest. Then, having talked among themselves a while, they turned around to me with signs of greeting, and, when he noticed this, my teacher smiled, and even greater honour still they did me, for one of their own company they made me, so that amid such wisdom I was six. Thus on we went, as far as to the light, talking of things where office silence here becoming, even as speech was where we spoke. We reached a noble castle's foot, seven times encircled by high walls, and all around defended by a lovely little stream. This last we crossed, as if dry land it were, through seven gates, with these sages I went in, and to a meadow of fresh grass we came. There people were, with slow and serious eyes, and in their looks of great authority, they spoke but seldom, and with gentle voice. We, therefore, to one side of it drew back into an open place so luminous and high that each and all could be perceived. There, on the green enamel opposite, was shown to me the spirits of the great, for seeing whom high glory in myself. I saw Electra with companions many, of whom I knew both Hector and Aeneas, and Caesar armed with shining falcon eyes, I saw Camilla with Penthesilea upon the other side, and King Latinus, who with the Vinia his own daughter sat. I saw that Brutus who drove Tarquin out, Lucretia, Julia, Marcia, and Cornelia, and all alone I saw the Saladin. Then, having raised my brows a little higher, the teacher I beheld of those that know, seated amid a philosophic group they all look up to him all honour him there socrates and plato i behold who nearer than the rest are at his side democritus who thinks the world chance born diogenes anaxagoras anthales empedocles heraclitus and zeno of qualities I saw the good collector, Dioscorides, I mean, Orpheus, I saw, Tully and Livy, and Moral Seneca, Euclid, the geometer, and Ptolemy, Hippocrates, Avicenna, Galen, Averroes, who made the famous comment. I cannot speak of all of them in full, because my long theme drives me on so fast that off my words fall short of what I did. The six-fold band now dwindles down to two. My wise guide leads me by a different path, out of the calm, into the trembling air, and to a place I come when naught gives light. End of chapter 46 Chapter 47 of Jerusalem to Revelations, A Quartet of Spiritual Experience, by William Blake and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. Inferno 5. 
the second circle sexual intemperance the lascivious and adulterers thus from the first of circles i went down into the second which surrounds less space and all the greater pain which goads to wailing there minos stands in horrid guise and snarls inside the entrance he examines sins judges and as he girds himself commits i mean that when an ill-born soul appears before him it confesses itself holy and thereupon that connoisseur of sins perceives what place in hell belongs to it and girds him with his tail as many times as are the grades he wishes it sent down before him there are always many standing they go to judgment each one in his turn they speak and hear and then are downward hurled oh thou that comest to the inn of woe said minos giving up on seeing me the execution of so great a charge see how thou enter and in whom thou put thy trust let not the gateways with deceive thee to him my leader said why dost thou too cry hinder thou not this fate ordained advance thus is it yonder world where there is power to do whate'er is willed so ask no more and now the woeful sounds of actual pain begin to break upon mine ears i now am come to where much wailing smiteth me i reached a region silent of all light which bellows as the sea doth in a storm if lashed and beaten by opposing winds the infernal hurricane which never stops carries the spirits onward with its sweep and as it whirls and smites them gives them pain whene'er they come before the shattered rock there lamentations moans and shrieks are heard there cursing they blaspheme the power divine i understood that to this kind of pain are doomed those carnal sinners who subject their reason to their sensual appetite and as their wings bear starlings on their way when days are cold in full and widespread flocks so doth that blast the evil spirits bear this way and that and up and down it leads them nor only doth no hope of rest but none of lesser suffering ever comfort them and even as cranes move on and sing their lays forming the while a long line in the air thus saw i coming uttering cries of pain shades borne along upon the aforesaid storm i therefore said who teacher are the people the gloomy air so cruelly chastises the first of those of whom thou wouldst have news the latter thereupon said unto me was empress over lands of many tongues to sexual vice so holy was she given that lust she rendered lawful in her laws thus to remove the blame she had incurred semiramis she is of whom one reads that she gave suck to ninus and became his wife she held the land the soldan rules the next is she who killed herself through love and to sicaeus ashes broke her faith the lustful cleopatra follows her see helen for whose sake so long a time of guilt rolled by and great achilles see who fought with love when at the end of life paris and tristan see and then he showed me 
and pointed out by name a thousand shades and more whom love had from our life cut off when i had heard my leader speak the names of ladies and their knights of olden times pity o'ercame me and i almost swooned poet i then began i gladly talk with those two yonder who together go and seem to be so light upon the wind thou'lt see thy chance when nearer us they are said he beseech them them by that same love which leadeth them along and they will come soon as the wind toward us had bent their course i cried o oh, toil-worn souls come speak with us so be it that one else forbid it not as doves when called by their desire come flying with raised and steady pinions through the air to their sweet nest borne on by their own will so from the band where dido is they issued advancing through the noisome air toward us so strong would love the tone of my appeal o oh, thou benign and gracious living creature that goest through the gloomy purple air to visit us who stained the world blood-red if friendly were the universal king for thy peace would we pray to him since pity thou showest for this wretched woe of ours of whatsoever it may please you hear and speak we will both hear and speak with you while yet as now it is the wind is hushed the town where i was born sits on the shore whither the po descends to be at peace together with the streams that follow him love which soon seizes on a well-born heart seized him for that fair body's sake whereof i was deprived and still the way offends me love which absolves from loving none that's loved seized me so strongly for his love of me that as thou seest it doth not leave me yet love to a death in common led us on cain's ice await of him who quenched our life these words were wafted down to us from them when i had heard those sorely troubled souls i bowed my head and long i held it low until the poet said what thinkest thou when i made answer i began alas how many tender thoughts and what desire induced these souls to take the woeful step i then turned back to them again and spoke and i began thine agonies francesca caused me to weep with grief and sympathy but tell me at the time of tender sighs whereby and how did love concede to you that ye should know each other's veiled desires and she to me there is no greater pain than to remember happy days in days of misery and this thy leader knows but if to know the first root of our love so yearning a desire possesses thee i'll do as one who weepeth while he speaks one day for pastime merely we were reading of lancelot and how love o'erpowered him alone we were and free from all misgiving oft did that reading cause our eyes to meet and often take the colour from our faces and yet one passage only overcame us when we had read of how the longed-for smile was kissed by such a lover this one here who never more shall be divided from me trembling all over kissed me on my mouth a galahad the book and he who wrote it no further in it did we read that day while one was saying this the other spirit 
so sorely wept that out of sympathy I swooned away as though about to die, and fell as falls a body that is dead. Inferno Six, The Third Circle, Intemperance in Food, Gluttons On my return to consciousness, which closed before the kindred couple's piteous case, which utterly confounded me with grief, new torments all around me I behold, and new tormented ones where'er I move, where'er I turn, and wheresoe'er I gaze. In the third circle am I, that of rain eternal, cursed cold and burdensome. Its measure and quality are never new. Coarse hail and snow and dirty-coloured water through the dark air are ever pouring down, and foully smells the ground receiving them. A wild beast, Cerberus, uncouth and cruel, is barking with three throats, as would a dog over the people that are there submerged. Red eyes he hath, a dark and greasy beard, a belly big, and talons on his hands. He claws the spirits, flays, and quarters them. The rainfall causes them to howl like dogs. With one side they make shelter for the other. Up do the poor profaners turn about. When Cerberus, the mighty worm, perceived us, his mouth he opened, showing us his fangs, nor had he any limb that he kept still. My leader then stretched out his opened palms, and took some earth, and with his fists well filled, he threw it down into the greedy throat, and, like a dog that barking yearns for food, and when he comes to bite it is appeased, since only to devour it doth he strain and fight, even such became those filthy faces of demon Cerberus, who thundering stuns the spirits so that they would fain be deaf. Over the shades the heavy rain beats down. We then were passing, as our feet we set, upon their unreal bodies which seem real. They each and all were lying on the ground, excepting one which rose and sat upright when it perceived us pass in front of it. O oh, thou that through this hell art being led, it said to me, Recall me if thou canst, for thou, before I unmade was, wast made. And I to it, the anguish thou art in, perchance withdraws thee from my memory so, it doth not seem that thee I ever saw. But tell me who thou art, that in so painful a place art set, and to such punishment, that none, though greater, so repulsive is. And he to me, Thy town, which is so full of envy, that the bag o'erflows already, owned me when I was in the peaceful life. Chiaco, you townsmen used to call me then, for my injurious fault of gluttony. I'm broken, as thou seest by the rain. Nor yet am I sad soul, the only one, for all these here are subject for like fault unto like pain. Thereat he spoke no more. Thy trouble, Chiaco, I replied to him, so burdens me that it invites my tears, but tell me, if thou canst, to what will come the citizens of our divided town, if any one therein is just, and tell me the reason why such discord hath assailed her. And he to me then, after struggling long, they'll come to bloodshed, and the boorish party will drive the other out with much offence. Then, afterward, the latter needs must fall within three suns, and the other party rise, by help of one who now is on the fence. A long time will it hold its forehead up, keeping the other under grievous weights, 
Howe'er it weep therefore, and be ashamed. Two men are just, but are not heeded there. The three sparks that have set men's hearts on fire are overweening pride, envy, and greed. Herewith he closed his tear-inspiring speech, and I to him, I have thee teach me still, and grant the favour of some further talk. Farinata, and Tegiayo, who so worthy were, Shakopo, Rusticucci, Arigo, and Mosca, and the others who were set on doing good. Tell me where these are, and let me know of them, for great desire constraineth me to learn if heaven now sweeten or hell poison them. And he, among the blackest souls are these, a different fault weighs toward the bottom each. If thou descend so far, thou mayest behold them. But when in the sweet world thou art again, recall me, prithee, unto others' minds, I tell no more, nor further answer thee. His fixed eyes thereupon he turned askance, a while he looked at me, then bowed his head, and fell therewith among the other blind. Then said my leader, He'll not wake again on this side of the angel trumpet sound. What time the hostile podesta shall come, each soul will find again its dismal tomb, each will take on again its flesh and shape, and hear what through eternity resounds. We thus passed through, with slowly moving steps, the filthy mixture of the shades and rain, talking a little of the future life, because of which I said, These torments, teacher, after the final sentence, will they grow, or less become, or burn the same as now? And he to me, Return thou to thy science, which holdeth that the more a thing is perfect, so much the more it feels of weal or woe. Although this cursed folk shall never more arrive at true perfection, it expects to be more perfect after than before. As in a circle round that road we went, speaking at greater length than I repeat, and came unto a place where one descends, there found we Plutus, the great enemy, Inferno seven, the fourth circle, intemperance in wealth, misers and prodigals, the fifth circle. Pape Satan, Pape Satan, Alep. Thus Plutus, with his clucking voice, began. That noble sage then, who knew everything, said to encourage me, "Let not thy fear distress thee." For whatever power he have, he'll not prevent our going down this rock. Then, to those swollen lips, he turned around and said, Be silent, thou accursed wolf, with thine own rage consume thyself with them. Not causeless is our going to the bottom. There is it willed on high, where Michael wrought vengeance upon the arrogant rebellion. As sails, when swollen by the wind fall down and tangled when the mast breaks even so down to the ground the cruel monster fell into the fourth ditch we descended thus advancing further o'er the woeful edge which bags all evil in the universe justice of god alas who heapeth up the many unheard-of toils and pains I saw, and wherefore doth our sin torment us so? As yonder, or Charybdis, doth the sea, which breaks against the one it runs to meet, so must the people dance a ring-dance here. I hear so folk, more numerous than elsewhere, on one side and the other, with great howls, rolling big weights around by strength of chest, they struck against each other, then, right there, each turned, and rolling back his weight, cried out, 
Why keepest thou? And wherefore throw away? They circled thus around the gloomy ring, On either hand and to the point opposed, Still shouting each to each their vile refrain. Then each turned back, when through his own half-ring He had attained the other butting place. And I, whose heart was well nigh broken, said, Now, teacher, show me who these people are, And tell me whether all these tonsured ones Upon our left ecclesiastics were. And he replied to me, They each and all were in their first life So squint-eyed in mind, That they with measure used no money there. Clearly enough their voices bark it forth, when e'er they reach the two points of the ring, where differences in fault unmateth them. These churchmen were, who have no hairy covering upon their heads, and popes and cardinals, among whom avarice works its mastery. And I to him, among such men as these, I surely, teacher, ought to recognize a few who by these sins polluted were. And he to me, thou shapest a vain thought, the undiscerning life which made them foul, now to all recognition makes them dark. To these two shocks they'll come eternally. These from the sepulchre will rise again close-fisted. These, shorn of their very hair, ill-giving and ill-keeping took from them the lovely world, and set them at this fray. To qualify it, I'll not use fair words. Now canst thou some behold the short-lived cheat of riches that are put in fortune's care, and for whose sake the human race contends, for all the gold there is beneath the moon, and all that was there once could not avail to make one of these weary spirits rest. Teacher, said I to him, now tell me further, what is this fortune thou dost touch upon which hath the world's good things thus in her claws? O oh, foolish creatures, said he then to me, how great the ignorance which hurteth you! I'd have thee swallow now my thought of her. The one whose knowledge everything transcends, so made the heavens, and so gave guides to them, that every part on every other shines, thus equally distributing the light. Likewise, for worldly splendours, he ordained a general minister and guide to change from time to time the vain goods of the world from race to race, from one blood to another, past all resistance by the minds of men. Wherefore, one people governs, and the other declines in power, according to her judgment, which hidden is, as in the grass, a snake. Your knowledge is not able to resist her, foreseeing she decides, and carries on her government, as theirs, the other god. Her permutations have no truce at all. Necessity compels her to be swept. Hence, oft it happens that a change occurs. This is the one who is so often cursed, even by those who ought to give her praise, yet give her blame amiss and ill repute. But she is blessed, and gives no heed to that. Among the other primal creatures glad, she turns her sphere, and blessed enjoys herself. But now to woe, more piteous, let's descend. Now falls each star that rose when I set out, And one is here forbidden too long a stay. We cross the circle to the other bank, Over a bubbling stream that poureth down, Along a ditch which from it takes its ship. Then purple-black, much darker was its water, and we, accompanying its dusky waves, went down and entered on an uncouth path. A swamp it forms, which hath the name of Styx, this dismal little brook, when it hath reached the bottom of the great 
malignant slopes, and I, who was intensely gazing there, saw muddy people in that slimy marsh, all naked and with anger in their looks. They struck each other, not with hands alone, but with their heads and chests and with their feet, and rent each other piecemeal with their teeth. Said the good teacher, Son, thou seest now the souls of those whom anger overcame. Nay, more, I'd have thee certainly believe that neath the water there are folk who sigh, and make this water bubble at its surface, as, wheresoe'er it turn, thine eye reveals. Stuck in the slime, they say, Sullen we were in the sweet air that's gladdened by the sun, bearing within us fumes of surliness. We now are sullen in the swamp's black mire. This hymn they gurgle down inside their throats, because they cannot utter it with perfect speech. And so we circled round the filthy fen, a great ark between the dry bank and the marsh, our eyes intent on those that swallow mud, and to a tower's foot we came at last. Inferno 8 The Fifth Circle Intemperance in Indignation The Wrathful and Sullen Styx The City of Dis I say, continuing, that long before we ever reached the lofty tower's foot, our eyes had upward toward its summit turned, because of two small flames we there saw placed, and of another answering from so far, that hardly could mine eyesight make it out. Then, to all wisdom see, I turned around and said, What saith this? And what replies that other fire? And who are they that made it? And he to me, Upon the filthy waves Thou canst already see what is expected, Unless the marsh's fog conceal it from thee. Bowstring ne'er shot an arrow from itself, That sped away so swiftly through the air, As I beheld a slender little boat Come toward us through the water thereupon, Under the guidance of a single boatman, Who shouted, Thou art caught now, wicked soul. O oh, Phlegius, Phlegius, said my master then, This time thou criest out in vain. No longer shalt thou have us than while we cross the swamp. Like one who listens to a great deceit practised upon him, and who then resents it, so Phlegius in his stifled wrath became my leader then went down into the boat and had me enter after him and only when i was in it did it laden seem soon as my leader and i were in the boat the ancient prow goes on its way and cuts more water than with others is its wont while we were speeding through the stagnant trench one stood before me filled with mud and said now who art thou that comest ere thy time? And I to him, Even though I come, I stay not. But who art thou that art become so foul? He answered, As thou seest, I am one who weeps. Then I to him, In sorrow and in grief, Mayst thou, accursed spirit, here remain, For thee I know, all filthy though thou be. Then, toward the boat, he stretched out both his hands, My wary teacher, therefore thrust him up, Saying, Away there with the other dogs! And with his arms he then embraced my neck, And kissed my face, and said, Blessed be she who pregnant was with thee, Indignant soul, he was a haughty person in the world, nor is there any goodness which adorns his memory, hence his shade is furious here. How many now, up yonder, think themselves great kings, who here shall be like pigs in mire, leaving behind them horrible contempt? And I said, 
teacher. I'd be greatly pleased to see him get a ducking in this broth before we issue from the marshy lake. And he to me, Thou shalt be satisfied before the shore reveal itself to thee. Tis meet that thou enjoy a wish like that. Soon after this, I saw the muddy people making such havoc of him that therefore I shall give praise and render thanks to God. They all were shouting, At Filippo Argenti! The spirit of the wrathful Florentine turning, meanwhile, his teeth against himself. We left him there. Of him I therefore tell no more. But on mine ears there smote a wail. Hence I intent ahead and bar mine eyes. The kindly teacher said, Now, son, at last, the town whose name is Dis is drawing near, with all its host of burdened citizens. And I said, Teacher, clearly I behold its mosques already in that valley there, vermilion as if issuing out of fire. And he to me, The eternal fire within, which keeps them burning, maketh them look red, as thou perceivest in this nether hell. Thereat we came inside the trenches deep, which fortify that region comfortless. To me its walls appeared to be of iron. Not without going first a long way round, we came to where the boatman cried aloud to us, Get out, for here the entrance is. More than a thousand o'er the gates I saw, of those that from the heavens had reigned, who vexed were saying, Who is he that without death is going through the kingdom of the dead? And my wise teacher thereupon made signs of wishing to have private talk with them. Their great disdain they somewhat checked and said, Come thou along, and let him go his way. Who with such daring entered this domain? Let him retrace alone his foolish road, And try it if he can, For thou shalt here remain, That him so dark a land didst show. Think, reader, whether I lost heart On hearing those cursed words, For I did not believe That I should e'er return on earth again. Oh, my dear leader, who hast made me safe, more than seven times, and extricated me from serious dangers which I had to face, forsake me not, said I, and so undone. If further progress be denied to us, let us at once retrace our steps together. That lord then, who had brought me thither, said, Be not afraid, for none can take from us our passage, since by such an want is given. But thou, await me here, and with good hope, Nourish and comfort thou thy weary soul, For I'll not leave thee in the nether world. Thus goes his way, and there abandons me, My tender father, and I in doubt remain, For yes and no contend within my head. I could not hear what he proposed to them, But with them there he did not long remain, For each in rivalry ran back within. They closed the gates, those enemies of ours, right in my master's face, who stayed outside, and walking with slow steps, returned to me. His eyes were downcast, and his eyebrows shorn of all self-trust, and as he sighed, he said, Who has forbidden me the homes of pain? Though I get angry, be not thou dismayed, he said to me, for I shall win the fight. Whate'er defensive stir be made within, this insolence of theirs is nothing new, For at a gateway less concealed than this They used it once, which still is lockless found. Death's scroll thou sawest over it, And now this side of it, one such descends the slope, Crossing the rings unguided, That through him the city will be opened unto us. End of chapter 47《チャプター48 of Jerusalem to Revelations 
A Quartet of Spiritual Experience by William Blake and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. Inferno 9. The Gate of the City of Dis. The Sixth Circle Heresy. The colour cowardice brought out on me who saw my leader coming back, the sooner repressed in him his unaccustomed hue. He stopped, attentive, like a man who listens, because his eyesight could not lead him far through the dark air and through the heavy fog. Yet we must win the battle, he began, unless one such did offer us herself. Oh, how I long for some one to arrive! I well perceived how, when he overlaid what he began to say by what came after, that these were words that differed from the first. But none the less his language gave me fear, because I lent to his unfinished phrase a meaning worse, perhaps, than he intended. Into this bottom of the dismal shell doth any of that first grade air descend, whose only penalty is hope cut off? I asked this question. He replied to me, It seldom comes to pass that one of us performs the journey whereupon I go. Tis true that I was conjured once before down here by magic of that wild Herito who used to call shades back into their bodies. My flesh had hardly been made bare of me when me she forced to enter yonder wall and thence withdraw a soul from Judas' ring. That is the lowest and the darkest place, and from the heaven that turns all things most distant. Well do I know the road, so be at rest. This marsh, from which the mighty stench exhales, girdles the woeful city round about, which, without wrath, we cannot enter now. And more he said, but I recall it not, because mine eye had made me wholly heed the glowing summit of the lofty tower, where three infernal furies stained with blood had suddenly uprisen all at once, having the members and the mien of women, and girt with water snakes of brightest green. For hair they had small serpents and horned snakes, wherewith their frightful temples were entwined. And he, who well the handmaids of the queen of everlasting lamentation knew, said unto me, Behold the fierce Erinias! This is Megira here upon the left, Electo, she who weepeth on the right, Tisiphon is between. Thereat he ceased. Each with her nails was tearing at her breast. They smote them with their hands, and cried so loud, that to the poet I drew close in dread. Now let Medusa come, we'll turn him thus to stone. They all cried out, as down they looked. Wrong were we not to punish Theseus' raid. Turn back and close thine eyes, for should the gorgon reveal itself and thou behold the face, there'd be no more returning up above. The teacher thus, and turning me himself, on my hands he did not so far rely as not to close mine eyes with his as well. O oh, ye in whom intelligence is sound, heed carefully the teaching which lies hidden beneath the veil of my mysterious lines. Then now was coming o'er the turbid waves the uproar of a dread-inspiring sound, because of which both shores were all awake, a noise like nothing other than a wind, impetuous, through opposing heats, 
which smites a forest, and without the least restraint shatters, lays low, and carries off its boughs. Dust-laden, and goes proudly on its way, and makes wild animals and shepherds flee. He freed mine eyes, and said, Direct thou now thy keenest vision o'er that ancient scum, to where that reeking smoke is most intense. As frogs before the hostile water-snake scatter in all directions through the water, till each is squatting huddled on the shore, more than a thousand ruined souls I saw, who thus from one were fleeing, who on foot but with dry feet was passing over sticks. That dense air he kept moving from his face, by often passing his left hand before him, and only with that trouble weary seemed. I well perceived he was a messenger from heaven, and to my teacher turned, with signs he warned me to keep still and bow before him. Ah, how disdainful did he seem to me! He reached the gate, and with a little wand he opened it, for hindrance had he none. O oh, people, thrust from heaven and held in scorn! Upon the horrid threshold he began, When dwells in you this overweening pride? Why is it that ye kick against the will from which its end can never be cut off, and which hath more than once increased your pain, of what avail to butt against the fates. Your Cerberus, if ye remember well, still sports for this a hairless chin and neck. He then returned along the filthy road, nor did he say a word to us, but looked like one whom other cares constrain and gnaw than that of him who in his presence is. Then we, with full assurance toward the town, after those holy words, addressed our steps. We entered it without the least contention, and I, who longed to look about and see the state of those whom such a fortress holds, when I was in it, cast mine eyes around, and see on every side an ample plain with anguish and with awful torture filled. Even as at Arles, where marshy turns the Rome, or as at Pola, near Quanaro's gulf, which bounds Italia and her border bathes, the sepulchres make all the ground uneven, so likewise did they hear on every side, save that their nature was more bitter here, for flames were spread about within the tombs, whereby they glowed with such intensity that no art needeth greater heat for iron. The lids of all of them were raised, and wailed, so woeful issued thence, that of a troop they seemed the wails of wretched, tortured men. Teacher, what sort of people are those there, said I, who buried in those ark-like tombs? make themselves heard by means of woeful sighs. Arch heretics are with their followers here, said he, of every sect, and far more laden than thou believest other sepulchres. Here like with like is buried, and more hot and less, so are the monuments. Thereat, when he had turned him to the right, we pass between the woes and lofty bastioned walls. Inferno 10 The Sixth Circle Heresy Heretics Now wends his way along a narrow path between the torments and the city's wall, my teacher, and behind his shoulders, I. O oh, lofty virtue, I began, that leads me around the impious circles at thy pleasure, converse with me, and satisfy my wishes. The people that are lying in the tombs, could they be seen? For all the lids are raised, it seems, and there is no one keeping guard. And 
he to me they all will be locked in when from jehoshaphat they here return together with the bodies they have left above on this side have their burial place with epicurus all his followers who claim that with the body dies the soul to the request however which thou makest thou'lt soon receive a due reply in here as also to the wish thou keepest from me and i good leader i but keep my heart concealed from thee in order to speak little nor hast thou only now thereto disposed me o oh, tuscan thou that through the town of fire dost go alive with such respectful speech in this place be thou pleased to stay thy steps thy very language makes thee manifest a native of that noble fatherland to which i was perhaps too great a bane all of a sudden issued forth these words from one of those ark tombs hence i in fear a little closer to my leader drew and he said turn around what doest thou see farinata who has risen there thou'lt see him wholly from his girdle up already had i fixed mine eyes on his and he was standing up with chest and head erect as if he had great scorn for hell my leader then with bold and ready hands pushed me between the sepulchres toward him saying now let thy words be frank and clear when i was neath his tomb he looked at me a while and then as though disdainfully he asked of me who were thine ancestors and i who was desirous to obey hid it not from him but revealed it all whereat he slightly raised his brows and said so bitterly were they opposed to me and to mine ancestors and to my party that i on two occasions scattered them if they were driven out i answered him from all directions they returned both times your people though have not well learned that art a shade then at the tomb's uncovered mouth rose at his side as far up as his chin i think that he had risen upon his knees round me he looked as if he wished to see whether some other one were with me there but when his doubt had wholly spent itself weeping he said if thou through this blind prison dost go by reason of high-mindedness where is my son and why is he not with thee and i to him i come not by myself he who is waiting yonder leads me here, one whom perhaps your Guido held in scorn. The nature of his torment and his words had read this person's name to me already. On this account was my reply so full. Then, of a sudden standing up, he cried, What such thou held? Is he not still alive? Doth not the sweet light strike upon his eyes? when he perceived the short delay i made before replying down upon his back he fell nor outside showed himself again the other one meanwhile the great souled man at whose request i stopped changed not his looks nor did he move his neck or turn his side and if continuing his previous words he said if they have badly learned that art far more doth that torment me than this bed and yet that lady's face who ruleth here shall not be lighted fifty times again and thou shalt know how heavy that art is and so must thou return to the sweet world pray tell me why so pitiless toward mine that people is in every law of theirs whence i to him the havoc and great slaughter which caused the arbia to be coloured red occasion such petitions in our church 
when, sighing, he had tossed his head, he said, In this thing I was not alone, nor surely had I without due cause moved with the rest, but I was yonder, where assent was given by every one to do away with Florence, the only one to open the defender. So may your seed eventually repose, I begged of him, and tie for me, I pray, the knot which has perplexed my thinking here. It seems, if well I hear, that ye behold beforehand that which time brings with itself, while in the present ye do otherwise. We see, he said, like one whose sight is poor, things that are far from us. To that extent the highest leader shines upon us still. When they approach, or are, our intellect is wholly vain, and we, if others bring no news, know nothing of your human state. Hence thou canst understand that holy dead will be our knowledge from that moment on, when closed shall be the gateway of the future. Thereat, for I was grieved at my mistake, I said, You'll therefore tell that fallen man his son is dwelling with the living still, and if in answering I was mute just now, cause him to know it was because my thoughts were struggling with the problem you have solved. And now my teacher was recalling me. With greater haste, I therefore begged the spirit that he would tell me who was with him there. He said, With or a thousand, here I lie. The second Frederick and the cardinal are here with him. I speak not of the rest. He thereupon concealed himself, and I, those words recalling, which seemed hostile to me, back toward the ancient poet turned my steps. The latter moved, and then, as on we went, he said to me, Why art thou so perplexed? And him, in what he asked, I satisfied. Then let thy mind preserve, that sage enjoined what thou hast heard against thyself. Pay now attention here. His finger then he raised. When in the sweet raised presence thou shalt be, of her whose lovely eyes see everything, from her thou know the journey of thy life. Thereafter, to the left, he turned his feet. We left the wall, and toward the middle went a longer path, which to a valley leads, which even up there unpleasant made its stench. Inferno 11 The Sixth Circle Heresy The Distribution of the Damned in the Inferno Upon the utmost verge of a high bank, formed in a circle by great broken rocks, we came upon a still more cruel pack, and there, by reason of the horrible excess of stench the deep abyss exhales, for shelter we withdrew behind the lid of a large tomb, whereon I saw a scroll which said, Pope Anastasius I contain, whom, out of the right way, Fortinus drew. Our going down from here must be delayed, so that our sense may first get used a little to this foul blast, we shall not mind it then. The teacher thus, and I, find that, therefore, some compensation, lest our time be lost. And he to me, see how I think of this. My son, within these rocks, he then began, are three small circles, which from grade to grade are similar to those thou leavest now. Full of accursed spirits are they all, but that hereafter sight alone suffice thee, hear how and wherefore they are packed together. Of all wrongdoing, which in heaven wins hate, injustice is the end, and each such end 
aggrieves by either violence or fraud. But whereas fraud is man's peculiar evil, God hates it most. Therefore the fraudulent are down below, and greater pain assails them. All the first circle holds the violent, but since against three persons force is used, its shape divides it into three great rings, both against God, one's neighbour and one's self may force be used, against themselves, I mean, and what is theirs, as clearly shown thou'lt hear. By force both death and painful wounds are given, one's neighbour, and thereby his property is ruined, burned, and by extortions robbed. The first ring, hence, torments in separate troops all homicides, and those that smite with malice, spoilers of property, and highway robbers. Upon oneself may one lay violent hands, and on one's goods, hence in the second ring must needs repentant be without avail, whoever of your world deprives himself gambles away and dissipates his means, and weepeth there where he should joyful be. Gainst God may force be used, by wittingly denying that he is by blasphemy, and by despising nature and his goodness, and therefore with its mark the lesser ring sealeth both Sodom and Cahors, and him who, speaking from his heart, despises God, unfraud whereby all consciences are bitten one may employ against a man who trusts him against a man who storeth up no trust this latter kind of fraud would seem to kill only the bond of love which nature makes hence in the second circle make their nest hypocrisy and flatterers and workers of magic coining theft, and simony, panders, and grafters, and such filth as these. In the other way, forgotten is the love which nature makes, and that which afterward is joined thereto, when special trust is born. Hence, in the smallest ring, where the universe its centre hath, and on which dis is seated, who e'er betrays, is spent eternally teacher said i thine argument proceeds most lucidly and full well classifies this deep abyss and those that people it but tell me now those of the muddy marsh those whom the wind drives those the rain beats down and those that with such keen tongues meet each other why aren't they punished in the red-hot town if god be angry with them and if not, why are they tortured in those several ways? And he to me, Why doth thine intellect wander so far from that which is its wont, or doth thy mind intently gaze elsewhere? Hast thou no recollection of the words with which thine ethics treats extensively the dispositions three which heaven rejects? incontinence and malice and insane bestiality and how incontinence offends god least and hence receives least blame if thou consider this opinion well and then remember who those are above that outside undergo their punishment well shalt thou see why from these wretches here they are set apart and why less wrathfully vengeance divine is hammering on them there. O oh, sun that healest every troubled sight, thou so contentest me when answering questions that doubt no less than knowledge pleases me. Return a little further back, said I, to where thou sayest usury offends goodness divine, and loose the tangled knot, Philosophy, said he to me, 
points out to him that understandeth it, and not in one part only, that nature takes her course from the intellect divine and from its art. And if thou note thy physics carefully, after not many pages shalt thou find that your art follows that as best it can, as the disciple him who teaches, hence your art is grandchild as it were to God. From these two things, if thou recall to mind the first of Genesis, must people needs obtain their livelihood and progress make. And as the usurer takes another course, nature both in herself and in her follower he scorneth, since in something else he trusts follow me now, for I pleased to go, because the fishes o'er the horizon quiver, and wholly over chorus lies the wane, and one descends the bank much further on. Inferno twelve, the seventh circle, the first ring, violence against one's fellow man, murderers and spoilers, Phlegaton. The place where to descend the bank we came was alp-like, and through what was also there, such that all eyes would be repelled by it. As is that downfall on the hither side of Trent, which sidewise smote the Adige, through earthquake or through failure of support, since from the mountain's summit whence it moved down to the plain, the rock is shattered so that it would yield a path for one above. Even such was the descent of that ravine, and on the border of the broken bank was stretched at length the infamy of Crete, who in the seeming heifer was conceived. And when he saw us there, he bit himself, like one whom inward anger overcomes. In his direction, then my sage cried out, Dost thou, perhaps, think Athens' duke is here, Who gave thee death, when in the world above begone, thou beast? For this man cometh not taught by thy sister, But is going by in order to behold your punishments. As doth a bull, who from his leash breaks free, The moment he receives the mortal blow, and cannot walk, but plunges here and there. So doing, I beheld the Minotaur, and he, aware, cried out, Run to the pass, tis well that while he rages thou descend. Thereat we made our way adown that heap of fallen rocks, which often neath my feet were moved, because of their unwonted load. I went along in thought, and he, perchance thou thinkest of this landslide, which is guarded by that beast's anger which I quenched just now. Now I would have thee know that, when down here to nether hell I came, that other turn, this mass of rock had not yet fallen down. But certainly, if I remember well, not long ere he arrived, who carried off from Dis the highest circles, mighty prey, on every side, the deep and foul abyss so trembled, that I thought the universe had felt the love, whereby, as some believe, the world to chaos hath been oft reduced, and at that moment this old mass of rock was thus both here and elsewhere overthrown. But turn thine eyes down yonder now, for lo, the stream of blood is drawing near to us, wherein boils who by violence harms others. O blind cupidity, O foolish wrath, that so dost din our short life goad us on, and after in the eternal steep us thus. I saw a wide moat curving in an arc, and such that it embraces all the plain, according as my escort had informed me, and in a file 
between it and the bank centaurs were running by with arrows armed as in the world it was their wont to hunt on seeing us descend they all stopped short and three of them detached them from the troop with bows and arrows they had chosen first and one cried from afar ye that descend the slope to what pain are ye coming tell it from there or else i draw my bow my teacher said our answer will we give to chiron yonder when we reach his side thus ever to thy harm was thy will rash he touched me then and said that one is nessus who died for lovely dear nearer's sake and who himself wrought vengeance for himself the middle one who gazes at his breast is that great chiron who brought up achilles the other pholus who so wrathful was they go by thousands round about the moat shooting each soul that from the blood emerges further than its own sin allotted it to those swift-footed beasts we then drew near chiron an arrow took and with its notch backward upon his jaws he pushed his beard when he had thus uncovered his great mouth he said unto his mates are ye aware that he who comes behind moves what he touches yet dead men's feet are not thus wont to do and my good leader who now reached his breast where the two natures are together joined replied he lives indeed and thus alone must i need show to him the dark abyss necessity is leading him not pleasure one who withdrew from singing praise to god gave me this new commission he is not a highwayman nor i a robber's soul but by the power through whom i move my steps along so wild a road bestow on us one of thy troop at whose side we may be and who may show us where one fords and carry this man upon his back for he is not a spirit who can travel through the air upon his right breast chiron turned and said to nessus turn around and guide them thus and if another troop should meet you cause it to stand aside then we with this safe escort skirted the edge of that red boiling stream wherein the boiled were crying out aloud i saw some people in it to their brows these tyrants are the mighty centaur said who took to bloodshed and to plundering here tears are shed because of heartless wrongs here alexander is and who for years grieved Cecily, fierce Dionysius. The brow which hath so black a head of hair is Azolino, the other which is blonde, a beast of est, who in truth was quenched up in the world by his unnatural son. I turned then toward the poet, but he said, Be he now first to thee, and second I. A little further on the centaur stopped over some people who it seemed emerged out of that boiling river from their necks on one side there a lonely shade he showed us and said he yonder in god's bosom pierced the heart which still is honoured on the thames then people i beheld who from the stream held out their heads and even all their chest and many did I recognize of these. Thus shallower and shallower became that blood, until it only cooked their feet. Here was the place for us to ford the ditch. Even as thou seest that boiling stream grow shallow more and more on this side here, the centaur said, I wish thee to believe that on this other side its bottom sinks increasingly until it joins the place where it behoveth tyranny to groan justice divine is over here tormenting that attila who was a scourge on earth pyrrhus and sextus and for ever milks the tears which with the boiling it unlocks 
from Rinia Daconato and Rinia Pazzo, who on the high roads waged so great a war. He then turned back and crossed the ford again. End of chapter 48